If you have your Bibles, take them and turn with me tonight, if you will, to Colossians, the third chapter. Colossians, the third chapter, beginning with verse 1, as we take a trip to a place called heaven. I'm a man on a mission with a message to make heaven real to this generation. It is my assignment from our Heavenly Father to prepare you to go there. Colossians 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. This is a direct command from God Almighty that we are to set our hearts and minds on heaven. One translation says, keep seeking heaven. Another translation says, diligently, actively, single-mindedly pursue the things from above. The most stupendous thought that can ever occupy the mind of man is heaven and how to get there. And thank God he's not left us to grope in darkness, but he's given us his word as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. The human heart longs for the blessed immortal assurance that one day we're going to live with God forever in a place that's free of sin, sickness, disease, sorrow, and grief. And I have good news for you. Jesus Christ has been preparing us a home, and he's personally promised that he's going to return and conduct us to live with him there throughout all eternity. Just prior to his departure from the earth, he gathered his disciples in an upper room in Jerusalem. I was just there just a few months ago, and he spoke these comforting words of reassurance to them. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. The literal Greek interpretation of verse 2 reads, Doubt not that there's for all of you a place in my Father's house, for I'm going on purpose to prepare it. The Bible teaches death is a certainty. The Bible teaches, Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed a man once to die, And after that, the judgment. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 13 says, Surely there is a hereafter. When God created you, he created you as an eternal being. According to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, the Bible says that God has set eternity in the hearts of men. Yet they cannot fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. The Bible teaches 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23, man is a spirit. He has a soul and he lives in a body. And since God created you to live for all eternity, the things of this world are never fully and permanently going to satisfy you. One day outside of the rapture of the church, you will die. Kings die, queens die, presidents die, the rich and the powerful, the poor and the illiterate, buried in the same ground, lying side by side, because whether you want to admit it or not, you are a very mortal creature, and you are just one heartbeat away from eternity. That's why you must heed the words of Jesus where he spoke in Matthew 16, 26. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Those are very sobering words. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 2, Verses 15 and 16, and I'm reading out of the message version. Don't love this world's way. Don't love the world's goods. Love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. Practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, 
has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from him. The world and all its wanting, wanting, wanting is on its way out. But whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. So death is a certainty. And you are immortal. The Bible teaches that you're going to live either in a place called heaven or a place called hell. Jesus actually spoke about hell more than he spoke about heaven. And 244 times in the New Testament alone, he warned us against going there. He said it was a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's a place of eternal separation from the peace and the love and the light of God. It's a place where you'll be tormented. It's a place where you'll fall and fall and fall and never land and burn and burn and burn and never be consumed. Who in the world in their right mind would choose such an eternal destiny? The Bible says very clearly in 1 Peter chapter 2, friends, this world is not your home. So don't make yourselves cozy in it. People want to know what happens when you die, when you draw your last breath. Do you just lapse into a state of unconsciousness? Do you go to sleep to be awakened sometime in the future to come back to this life? Is there a life better than this life? I believe there is. I have been there. It's a real, literal place. And I want to take you on a journey to that place and be, pre be sure that you're prepared to go there. For the Apostle Paul said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Death for a child of God is not a tragedy. It's not a sad end. It's a glorious promotion. It's a glorious new beginning. It's the most important decision you will ever make in this life. And that's to settle where you're going to spend eternity. You make that decision in this life. I was born on March the 1st, 1949 in Dallas, Texas, under the name Gary Lynn Dobbins. At a very early age, my alcoholic parents proved they did not want the responsibility of raising my little sister and I. And so they took us and put us on the front steps of a porch of a family by the name of Wood. This family was to go through the legal process in the state of Texas, the capital being Austin, to adopt us into their family, legally changing our name and granting unto us all the rights and privileges of one bearing the family name. I can easily identify with the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, 15, where he says, we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but rather we've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The word adoption means being placed as a son to a family with all the rights and privileges of one bearing the family name. The word Abba Father is very intimate in the Greek. It means Papa, Papa, or Daddy, Daddy. In this new environment, our life drastically changed. When my father was in a drunken stupor, he would take cigarettes and extinguish them between my legs just to see my response. But now that heartache and pain was behind me. My little sister and I were taken on a regular basis to the Hillcrest Southern Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, where I heard the greatest message that mortal man can ever hear, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible teaches all who sin, all have come short of the glory of God. The Bible teaches, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So when the pastor offered the invitation in childlike simplicity, I responded and prayed a simple little prayer and asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart. Now just joining a church will not guarantee you access 
into heaven. Just being water baptized will not guarantee you that you will spend eternity in a place called heaven. Water won't wash away dirt without a little soap. So how in the world is it going to wash away your sin? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So I was washed in the precious red blood of Jesus, guaranteeing me access when it was time to enter into this beautiful place that has been prepared for the redeemed. I grew up in Dallas, Texas, but because of economic reasons, my parents moved to a town called Farmington, New Mexico, that borders on the four corners of Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. I uh, went to high school there, and uh, I helped my father actually build what is now known as the Four Corners area. And I make this statement very humbly, but I make it only to emphasize the tremendous miracle of which I'm about to share with you. For three years in a row, God had endowed me with a talent to which I gave to him. And I won number one in all state solo competition. With that, I received a scholarship of which I chose to apply to Wayland Baptist University in Plainview, Texas. I went the first semester. I was returning home. It was December 23rd, 1966. My cousin called me on the phone. He said, we're going to have a high school class reunion. He said, we're going to have a party over at my house tonight. He said, bring your little sister and come, and we'll just have a good time and catch up on what's going on in everyone's life. So my little sister and I went over there, and my father uh, let me borrow his Oldsmobile station wagon. They don't make cars like that anymore. That car was built like a tank. And uh, we went and we had a wonderful time of reunion, fun and games. There was no drinking, there was no drugs, just good, clean atmosphere. And the party broke up about probably 10, 20, 10, 25, and we started home. Snow was beginning to fall that evening in Farmington. It was already on the grass, beautiful, and uh, the Christmas lights were adorning the houses. The, the Christmas season was in the air. And my little sister, who had a beautiful, melodious soprano voice, began to sing. I love to hear her sing. She began to sing Silent Night, Holy Night. And I was captivated with her beautiful voice when suddenly she had a blood-curdling scream. Farmington, New Mexico was in the midst of a big oil field boom at the time. And uh, there was a truck illegally parked on the street. It was saturated in oil. I never saw it. My little sister saw a reflection in the headlights and she screamed to warn me, but it was too late. We crashed directly into the back of that truck. There was an explosion. Uh, there was a sharp searing pain across my facial anatomy. And then I was relieved of all pain. Dying, it was just simply like taking your clothes off and laying them aside. I was caught up in a bright, brilliant light, not as blinding as the lights that are currently shining in my face. <laughs> Suddenly, angels took me underneath and lifted me up. Isaiah says that's what happens whenever a believer dies. And the angels began to escort me and lift me up in a swirling, massive, funnel-shaped cloud. I began to go up, up, up. The angels began to say, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive glory and power. Wisdom and dominion be given unto thee forever, O Lord. Amen and amen. 
And we've had some wonderful singing tonight. But you've never heard singing until you've heard a maraud of the heavenly angels singing the hallelujah chorus. Suddenly the cloud opened up and I saw a gigantic golden satellite suspended in heaven. The Bible says in Job 26, 7 that God stretched out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. There was nothing there to substantiate this majestic, beautiful city. It was laid out in the form of a square. I saw the 12 foundations of the city with the names of the 12 apostles inscribed upon them. I saw the 12 gates of pearl with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel written over them. Many years ago, over 30 years ago, I was in Florida and a NASA scientist who actually placed Neil Armstrong on the moon attended a full gospel businessmen's meeting that I was speaking at. And he said, son, he said, we've equated the dimensions of heaven as recorded in the book of Revelation. And he said, actually, it's 2.7 billion cubic miles in circumference. It's over 780,000 stories high. And there's enough room to comfortably accommodate 100,000 million people. Now, I'm not saying that's all it will accompany, but I'm saying that many people have never lived on planet Earth at one time. And it's more than enough to accompany that magnitude of people. Heaven is a real place on God's map. It's stable, it's secure, it's permanent. It looked like a city of pure, solid, transparent glass. This same scientist told me that there's an impurity in gold. He said when that impurity is removed, gold is not yellow in its refined state, but rather it's crystal clear. I saw all of those 12 foundations. The Bible records them in Exodus chapter 28, verses 15 through 21. When I was in Israel, I brought the replica, the ring that I wear of the high priest's breastplate. Each and every one of these foundations has a significant meaning, and I won't take time to share it with you. I'll just share the first. Jasper, which stands for diamonds and the glory of God. Now listen to me, ladies. One day you're not going to wear it as an earring or a uh, a wedding ring or an anklet or a bracelet, sweetheart, you're going to be walking on it. Do you understand that? You're going to be walking on pure, solid diamonds. And men, here's the kicker. We don't have to foot the bill. <laughs> Glory to God. Our Heavenly Father has provided it for us. The grass was adorned and sprinkled like dew with diamonds. When I would walk on the grass, not like the carpet upon which I'm now standing, but the grass would come all the way through my feet, yet there were no indentions where I had previously stepped. The Bible says concerning this beautiful place called heaven that nothing will enter in it to defile it. The Bible records without holiness, no man shall see God. So are you interested in holiness? The Bible says, blessed are they that are pure in heart, for they shall see God. Only those who've been washed in the precious blood of Jesus are going to be the inhabitants of this city. In this city, there'll be no disappointment. There'll be no weariness. There'll be no sorrow. There'll be no more pain. Guess what? We'll never have to pay rent on our mansions in heaven. Taxes will never come due. We're never going to get thirsty or hungry. In fact, the Bible says in heaven we're going to be doing something. Revelation 22.3 says the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city. And his servants will serve him. So we need to get prepared down here on the earth for what we're going to do when we go to heaven. In heaven, you're not going to just be floating around on a cloud, strumming a heart for all eternity. You're going to have activity. You're going to have an assignment. 
There'll be no hospitals there. There'll be no funeral dirge played there. There'll be no crosses on the hillsides of glory. You're going to be perpetually young forever and ever. And young people, I threw this one in just for you. There's no pimples in heaven. Because there's absolutely no imperfection. I looked upon this massive gate of which I've already given you the dimensions. And there was an angel standing in front. This angel was at least 70 feet tall. I never saw an angel when I was in heaven less than 40 feet tall. This angel was adorned with a massive, beautiful gold robe. And he had a sword, beautiful golden uh, hair. And uh, I began to walk up this green grassy hill and begin to approach one of these gates to enter into. I must reemphasize that access into the city is gained because you have been washed in the precious red blood of Jesus. I entered in, I walked down a corridor, I went a little ways and there was greeted by a friend of mine who had died in a previous accident in high school. In fact, he was my best friend. And I immediately recognized him. I ran over and embraced him, which answers in my mind, will you know one another in heaven? Well, absolutely you're going to know people in heaven. Matthew uh, eight eleven says, sitting down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, how are you going to sit down with them if you don't know who they are? And uh, so I recognized my friend. And I've incorporated this into my testimony because I get asked this question often. People say, well, what about my family member or my loved one that I'm really not sure whether they made heaven or not? I could give you at least three scriptures, but I'll give you only one. Psalm 9, 5, thou hast rebuked the heathen, thou hast destroyed the wicked, thou hast put out their name forever and ever. And so what that really means is you'll just have no remembrance of them whatsoever when you get to heaven. But that ought to motivate us the more, amen, to be sure that all uh, have access to participate and live in this beautiful city. My friend took me to a library. It was adorned with books. There were all kinds of books, prayer requests, spiritual growth in the Lord, the number of souls that we have led to the Lord Jesus Christ. My friend took me over to the Lamb's Book of Life, sitting on the table. It was just a, a, a book that was covered in beautiful white lamb skin and lamb's wool. And then he flipped the pages open and he showed me where it said, paid in full by the precious red blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. I had a right to be there. I actually saw what happens when someone received Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Hebrews chapter 12 talks about a great host of witnesses. I saw what looked like bleachers, like you would attend a sporting event. And people would just occasionally go over there and they'd be sitting there and they'd be cheering you on. They'd be encouraging you. There's a great host of heavenly witnesses, your friends, your loved ones, your family members who've gone on before. And they're encouraging you to run your race and finish the assignment that God has given you here upon the earth. I was blessed to sit at one time under the late Pastor John Osteen. Pastor John Osteen used to tell us, great it is to dream the dream when you stand in youth by the starry stream, but a greater thing, a greater thing, a greater thing is to fight life through and at the end say the dream is true. When Pastor Osteen first heard my testimony, he called me on the phone and he said, Gary, you need to put your testimony into print. And so Dr. Larry, through his prompting, I wrote the book that now has gone literally across the world and been translated into five different languages. But I saw people up there, your loved ones, my loved ones, people that, that have gone on before us, and I saw them, they're, they're not interested in what you're wearing, what kind of car you're driving. 
but they are interested in encouraging you to continue on and to fulfill the race. They're saying, in essence, we've run our race. We've been faithful. We've completed our assignment. Now you continue on until we meet at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I saw a man come down and receive Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. I saw someone who knew that man on the earth sitting in those bleachers. They left very quickly. They went unrestrained and they went over to another section of heaven. And there they found this man's mother. And they said to her, rejoice, rejoice. Your son is coming home. And there was great joy and there was great rejoicing that this man had received Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. And the angels would just would fold their wings and bow their heads because they are created beings. And so there are people that are encouraging you to be faithful and to run your race and fulfill your assignment. And then my friend took me to a gigantic grand auditorium. I saw God's throne, emerald rainbow surrounding God's throne. God appeared to be a young man. If I had time theologically, I could share with you over 44 different uh, scenarios where God came down and appeared to man. I saw lightning flashes. I saw thunder rolls, but I heard thunder rolls, but there was no fear whatsoever. I saw the 24 elders representing the patriarchs of the Old Testament and the apostles of the New Testament. And they would take their crowns off and they'd throw them down at God's throne. God's throne looked like a magnificent, beautiful, crystal clear sea of pure, sparkling diamonds. I, I, I saw angels. There was a variety of angels in heaven. These particular angels that were around God's throne had six wings. They were aflame with intensity for their devotion and adoration and worship to God Almighty. They would carry these golden bowls. From these bowls would flow a watery substance. I asked my friend, I said, what is that? And John said, that's tears of the saints on the earth below. Whenever you shed a tear, it doesn't just absorb into your clothing and go unnoticed. God has an angel, and that angel takes it and cups it and takes it directly to the throne room of God on your behalf. And then from these golden bowls, I saw that I, I can only express as what appeared and looked like dry ice. I asked my friend as it was billowing out and flowing out and the angels were hovering around saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. They were flying around and they were taking these bowls. They were coming to the earth and they were coming back and I asked my friend, I said, what is that? And he said, that's the praises of God's people on the earth and in heaven above. When we were worshiping, magnifying, and praising God here just a few moments ago, angels were here. Angels were gathering up all that praise, and they were taking it directly to the throne room of God on our behalf. Doesn't that make you want to praise God more enthusiastically than you've ever praised Him before? Come on, let's give the angels something to do. Lift up your voice. Lift up your voice and let the angels take that praise. Take our praises and receive it, O oh God, as a direct, sweet-smelling savor into your nostrils. Around God's throne, there were seven lamps. It looked like a menorah, and they were a flame, which represents and typifies the precious Holy Spirit Flowing directly from the throne room of God came a beautiful crystal clear body of water the Bible calls the river of life. It diversified into the 12 streets. On either side of those streets were trees, magnificent trees. It would take at least 10 men 
arm to arm in this auditorium to go around one of those trees. They bore distinct different kinds of fruit than is found here upon the earth. When you eat the fruit, you become the fruit. Now, Dr. Larry, I used to say that and quickly move on, but I had to stop and explain what I was saying uh, because people thought I meant you become fruity. When you eat that fruit, suddenly you understand God's divine mysteries. Every one of us have questions. Why this? Why that? We ask God and we desire answers, but suddenly you'll know in God's vast realm of knowledge, things that you have sought him to know for many, many years, and you will comprehend and understand them. In front of me, the river of life was there, and suddenly I saw people adorned with uh, 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 three layers of clothing. Two of them were tightly fit to your body. The third was like the sleeveless garment that the high priest wore in Exodus chapter 28 when he went to the Holy of Holies. On that garment, there were all kinds of precious jewels. You, for, you will, for instance, just know that Pastor and Ms. Allison were pastors here upon the earth. You'll know if a person was a singer. You'll know if, if, if they were a missionary or a prophet or a teacher. You'll just know it. There was no drawing to male or female body parts, but they're arrayed in this garment of praise and humility and holiness. Suddenly I'm adorned in that. And I go down into the water. The water, water really had no base to it, but it, it would substantiate you. And then the water rose until it literally consumed me. In the water, I could breathe in the water. I could reach down and pick up golden nuggets bigger than my fist. All kinds of precious jewels would just filter through my finger like sand. Jesus, being the light of the city, would reflect upon it, producing an aura of colors of which I cannot adequately describe to you. I can only say to you, my precious beloved friend, if you've got a problem with prosperity, you're going to be miserable in heaven. I was then lifted up, and I was put on the other side of the river. There I saw a host of people from every nationality, every tribe upon the face of the earth. They were all singing, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the royal diadem and crown him. Crown him Lord, Lord of all. Dr. Larry, I turned to my friend John. I said, John, why are they singing hymn number 132 in the Baptist hymnal on the earth below? John said, Gary, all songs of the Spirit originate in heaven. He said, then they're dropped into the heart of someone who will be faithful to give it forth to the glory of God. The first time I heard the chorus that Pastor Larry led us in a few moments ago, I love you, Lord, was in heaven. That's the first time I ever heard it. I heard it in heaven. I'd hear it down on earth many years later. First time I ever heard the little chorus, Alleluia, was in heaven. First time I heard the chorus, He is Lord, was in heaven. First time I ever heard many of the songs that we sing today to magnify and glorify God was in heaven. I would sing musical notes just float over the mountains and they would go into a person and they would spontaneously break out into song. I'm not evangelistically exaggerating. I'm just telling you what I saw. The streets were called Hallelujah Boulevard and Praise the Lord Avenue. The trees would clap. People say to me often, Brother Gary, you need to slow down. Read my lips, sweetheart. I'm not going to let some flower out sing me. I'm not going to let some tree out clap me. I'm going to praise him in the morning. I'm going to praise him in the noontime. And I'm going to praise him when the sun goes down. Come on, let's just praise God. Let's lift our voices up and praise him. He's worthy. He's worthy, worthy, worthy of our praise. When you first enter into heaven, without exaggeration, millions could inhabit that area. 
What I saw was children. I saw children that had died from diseases, accidents, different uh, causes. I saw little children rolling in the grass with a lion like you would play with Fluffy, your pet cat. I saw beautiful, magnificent birds that would just come and rest upon the heads of those precious children. I saw them riding horses. I saw all the beautiful animals there. People always ask me, are there animals in heaven? Well, of course there are animals in heaven. In God's original creation, he created animals for our enjoyment. And in heaven, there will be no poisonous snakes. We won't have to worry about the roar of the lion. Amen. And I saw that. I just saw little children there playing with this variety of God's animal creation. But what captured my attention was what looked like clay. And angels were working on this clay like you would mold something. I asked my friend, I said, what's that? He said, that's aborted and miscarried children. And God was forming and fashioning them into the child that they were destined to be. Now, if you had an abortion, you can be washed in the blood of Jesus. You can be totally forgiven and you will see that child once again. If you had a miscarriage, rest in confident assurance that you are going to see your children again. Zechariah 8, 5 declares the city as one with boys and girls playing in her streets. But until such time, I actually saw, I saw a mother reunited with her child and the child run over and grab her mother. And the, the, there was beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, love transpired before them. So until such time as you go to, to heaven, just be comforted with the assurance that God is taking care of your children if they're already there and they're in his school of learning and they're being molded and fashioned into the child that they were destined to become. And then my friend took me to perhaps one of the strangest things I've witnessed on my tour to heaven, but one of the most significant. I was about 500 yards from the throne room of God. There was a building there, much like you would store your personal possessions. What captured my attention was what was written on the outside of the door. It said, unclaimed blessings, unclaimed blessings. If you uh, will go on my website, if you'll flip on the last time that I was on It's Supernatural with Sid Roth, he has hired a production team and they actually depicted it almost exactly the way it was. I called Sid on the phone and I said, Sid, that's it. That's it. That's exactly what I saw. When I opened up the door, there were just legs hanging there from the wall. There were arms. There were every part of one's anatomy. You say, Brother Wood, why does there need to be a place like that in heaven? Because God has a spare part room. God has a miracle for you. Many years ago, I think this man has just gone home to be with the Lord. I received this from, from Brenda, who is uh, Sister Billy Brim's uh, daughter. And she put this in one of the newsletters recently. His name was Arthur Burt. I believe he's now gone home to be with the Lord. But back in 1934, he gave a prophetic utterance. Here was the prophetic utterance concerning the last day revival. It shall come as the breath, the breath shall become wind, the wind shall become rain, the rain floods, the floods torrents of power, and arms and legs shall come down from heaven. And this time there shall be no ebb. This time the tide is coming in, but it will not go out again. Now let me tell you what I saw. I saw people on the earth pray. I saw their prayers go up. I saw through the name of Jesus it was received by our Father. Jesus dispatches angels. Angels went and got the miracle. Angels came and they brought the miracle to answer the prayer request. Sometimes it was instantaneous. 
Sometimes there was interference in the spirit realm. You remember what happened in Daniel? You remember Daniel prayed, but the prince of the air tried to prevent that manifestation from coming forth. But the prayer request was sent the moment of Daniel's utterance. I saw people in a service just like this, not much bigger crowd than we have tonight. I saw some people lift up their hands and say, I believe I receive. And I saw the miracle instantly go into them. I saw other people begin to make excuses. They begin to say things like, well, I don't have enough faith to receive, or this isn't the day of miracles. Now listen to me, beloved. There never was a day of miracles. I said there never was a day of miracles. There's a God of miracles. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And all he wants you to do is just reach up, believe, and receive. Recently, I just got a report from Suzanne. She lives in O'Fallon, Missouri. And uh, she had gone to the hospital thinking that she had bronchitis. They did a check s ray. The doctor came in alarmed and showed that uh, she had heart failure. In fact, at that very moment, she was having a major heart attack. The doctor said, we're going to have to operate immediately. She requested a phone call. She called me. I just happened to be at my home in Houston. All she told me was that she was just in the hospital and they thought maybe it was a heart problem. So I prayed a very simple little prayer. And then I closed by saying, oh, Suzanne, remember that God has a spare part room. Just reach up, believe, and receive. She says at that moment the Spirit of God hit her and it knocked her off the gurney on which she was laying. The doctors came back in. She requested another EKG and the doctor came in and told her, Lady, you have had a miracle. Something has happened. Her heart was functioning properly. She received a new heart. Come on, let's give God glory. Let's give him honor. Let's give him praise. Lift up your hands right now. Whatever you're believing the Father for, just say with me, I believe I receive. Say, this is my night to receive my miracle. I will not be denied. The situation I am in is subject to change. Jesus Christ is here right now to give me my miracle. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. So I choose to be free of sin, sickness, disease, and poverty. Jesus bore them for me. I choose not to bear them any longer. I choose to walk in the glorious freedom and liberty that he died to provide for me. Let's give him praise. Come on and give him praise. Come on and praise him. He's worthy of our praise. Then my friend took me to the mansion I'll spend all eternity in. Each mansion is designed to your liking. And each mansion was different. I saw all kinds of different things in different mansions. When I went into my mansion, it was not ready for occupancy. There was three buckets of paint in what I would describe as a living room area. My friend reached over, dipped his hand into one, flung it against the wall, and the beautiful floral arrangement instantly appeared right before my eyes. Now, if you got to know me, if you got to be in a series of services with me, you would discover this is just my personality. I picked up the whole bucket. I flung it up in the air. And the whole room was just saturated with the sweetest smell of roses. And my friend said, it's not ready for you to inhabit. You have to leave. And so I left and I went out and I walked down that street of pure, solid, transparent gold. And there I had an encounter with Jesus. When I saw Jesus, I did exactly what every one of you are going to do when you first see him. 
I fell at his feet as a dead man. And Jesus reached over and just lifted me up. He just stood me up. And Jesus stood about six foot two. And I have to answer this question because I get asked this question every single week. I think it's hilarious, but I get asked it every single time I give my testimony. What nationality was Jesus? You're laughing, but I get asked that every single time. He's Jewish. He's Jewish. You're not going to lose your ethnic origin when you go to heaven. I saw his olive complexion. I saw where they planted the crown of thorns, pushed down deep into his brow. I saw where they drove the nails into his hands. Now he's not a little bitty baby. Now he's the son of God sitting at the right hand of God, our heavenly father, ready to make intercession on our behalf. I saw his magnificent white regal robe, a purple sash that said King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He had a white flowing beard. His hair was of the rabbinical curls. He looked like a Jewish rabbi. There's a little girl that's painted a picture and I've seen that picture and that's the best description of Jesus that I've seen. It's very, very accurate, except I saw him, of course, with the white hair, the glorified uh, state of his appearance. His eyes were blue. Jews from the house tribe lineage of David are known to have blue eyes. Jesus began to write upon the tables of my heart a message now that I have faithfully delivered to this generation for the past 47 years. Jesus said, I will be your focus. You will worship and enjoy me forever. All that I have created for you, it is for your pleasure. Heaven is my creation for you. I am the center of it all. He said, I'm sending you back on assignment. He said, I want you to tell people, don't ever bind to the condemnation of the devil that they're unworthy. He said, tell them that they're worthy because I've redeemed them by my precious blood. He said, tell people there's a song to sing. There's a missionary journey to take. There's a message to proclaim. There's a book to write. Some of you right here, along with Dr. Larry, have a book down inside your spirit. I urge you, write that book, put it out for the glory of God. That's part of the message that Jesus spoke to me. Now, Jesus spoke to me these words. Sid Roth told me, he said, you need to really emphasize this. I proudly served in the army. One thing I learned when I was in the army, that when you're in the presence of a general, keep your mouth shut and just report or do whatever he says. And so I stood before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he said to me, why do my people not believe in me? He didn't say, why did the heathen not believe in me? He said, why do my people not believe in me? Why do my people reject me? Why do they not walk in obedience to my commandments? So I simply share what he shared. And then he spoke to me many things, but I've summed it up in three areas that I'll give you very quickly that'll mark his soon imminent return. I believe with all my heart, we're the generation that's going to see the return of the Lord. I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. I'm not looking for a hole in the ground. I'm looking for a hole in the sky. Soon and very soon, the trump of God is going to sound. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Oh, we're going to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And what a glorious, glorious time it's going to be. Jesus told me just prior to his return that there would be a spirit of restoration that would prevail throughout the land. Restoration means to give back or to make up. It's payday for the church and it's paid back for the devil. Jesus told me just before he returned to earth, there'd be a great transfer of funds from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. He said, tell my people they don't have a provision problem. 
they have a revelation problem. And when they find out who I am, I am Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, their provider. And they begin to function and operate in that, in that realm. Then their reaping would overtake their sowing. The enemy's going to come and he's going to throw tears and he's going to do everything possible to stop you from uh, reaping your harvest. But just keep holding on. Don't give up to the prophetic words and the scripture that has been spoken unto you. Jesus said in the last days, the evil one is going to come and release false doctrines to cause people to begin to operate in wrong motives. He'd said there'd be a strong political spirit of manipulation and witchcraft that would seek to control people through deceit and lies. And so we must operate in discernment. Are we not currently living in that time frame right now? Jesus said, get ready for restoration in relationships. My wife and I are proud to have a, a wonderful son named David Lynn Wood. But when David turned 16 years of age, he got involved with a group of young people that began to lead him astray from the principles of which we had taught him in the Word of God. Association is a primary way. There's a transference of spirits. Be, sure, be careful who you associate with. People are either going to build you up or they're going to tear you down. One day in a rage of anger, my son looked at me, pointed his finger in my face and said, I'll see you dead or in jail and I don't care which one comes first. I said, David Lee and I've already died once. I don't plan on breaking the law, so I don't opt for either thing that you have just put before me. Things were real tense in our home. My wife found the scripture, Isaiah 54, 13. Great is the peace of our children. We stood on that scripture, brother, for two solid years. Only the Holy Spirit could orchestrate this. I was preaching a Sunday morning on the return of the prodigal son. My son had drifted away. He had gone away from God. But on that particular Sunday morning, the Spirit of God brought him. And he sat there in the service and listened to the Word of God. And he responded and he repented. And now he's my best friend. He's a very uh, prosperous, successful businessman in Houston, Texas. He supports our ministry on a monthly basis. He's married to our beautiful daughter-in-law, Shelly, and given us a precious grandson named Bailey. Get ready for restoration. Get ready to get back what the devil has stolen from you. How many of you have children that are away from the Lord? Lift your hand up right now. They're away from God. I want to pray. Heavenly Father, in the mighty and comparable name of Jesus Christ, right now I send out the angels, the heirs of the household of faith, to go to sever all the cords that are wrapped around these precious youth. And we lay hold that they will turn from darkness. They will come out of darkness and they will come back to light and they'll return back to their parents in restoration and relationship. And Father, we give you the glory and the honor and the praise for it. In Jesus' matchless, wonderful name. Come on, let's praise him. Come on, give God the glory. Number two, the Lord spoke to me that there would be a great emphasis upon prayer just prior to his return. He taught me how to pray. He said, Gary, always pray, it is written. He said, find a scripture upon which you could stand and claim that scripture regarding whatever you're believing for and declare it is written. He said, once you declare that, then you can confidently state it is finished. He showed me the circle around the earth. He showed me demonic activity. He showed me demon forces that would gather strongholds over certain areas. And the more that people would give in to those spirits and operation, 
they would send out and gather reinforcements. It looked to me like great swarms of flies and it would darken certain areas of the land because of their influence. But when we God's people got in unity and we began to pray and we began to lift up our voices and declare it is written, then God showed me that our prayers went up like sharp barbed arrows and they permeated all of that atmosphere and broke it asunder and scattered that demonic influence and allowed the blessings of God to rain down over an area. So the more prayer, the less the demonic activity. And then thirdly, the Lord spoke to me that there would be an outburst of miracles. An outburst of miracles. Mama Billy Brim took that when she heard me share it. And once a month now, she has monthly miracle rallies. And all across the land, people are being healed as a result of what the Lord spoke to me. You just heard the miraculous testimony of my precious little daughter and how God touched her. Recently, I was in a Baptist church. I go to any church that will allow me to share, and I share as much as I'm allotted to share at the time. I shared about heaven. That's what they were interested in. And uh, then I offered an invitation. People came forward, received Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And then I shared that I would pray for healing. One mother, Dr. Larry, came and brought her little seven-year-old boy in her arms. And she was just holding him in her arms. And I looked at him and I said, son, what do you want Jesus to do for you tonight? And he replied by saying to me, I just want to be normal like everybody else my age. And so I looked and replied, well, what makes you think you aren't normal? And his mother jumped in and said, Dr. Wood, my son was born with no bones in the bottom of his feet. He is unable to walk and he wants to be able to walk and run and play just like all the other little boys his age. And so I just took him in my arms. I just prayed a simple little prayer. I called upon our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father dispensed the host of angels. The angels brought this young boy's spare parts and the miracle spoke for itself. When I put the boy down on the floor, he began to run all over the auditorium. The pianist fell off the pew and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. It's a Baptist church now, okay? Not a walk on the water type church, a Baptist church. Are you with me? Are you with, Are you out there? The pastor jumped up in awe and said, we just witnessed a notable miracle. I couldn't pass it up. I said, how many of you want this miracle work in God to manifest himself on your behalf? That, uh, that's a spirit-filled Baptist church now. As they all were baptized in the precious, precious Holy Spirit. Get ready, get ready for an outburst of miracles. I could just preach on miracles. I've got a whole book back there that is just nothing but miracles in it. I personally have seen four people raised from the dead. Our Jesus is a miracle worker and he's here tonight to manifest on your behalf and give you a miracle. Lift up your hands. Say, I believe and I receive. I'm in the presence of Jesus. There's so much more that I don't have time to tell you. So many of these signs are being fulfilled right now in our midst. I was dead for 61 minutes. That life ceased to flow. And my little sister was sitting next to me and she heard the doctors pronounce me dead. They were feverishly working to sustain and save her life and get her transported to the hospital as quickly as possible. Once she realized I was dead, she began to cry out, Jesus, 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 Jesus. There's something about the name of Jesus. 
Pastor John Osteen used to love to give my testimony. I used to love to hear him give my testimony. I'd get so excited hearing him give my testimony and it would dawn on me, he's talking about me. That's, uh, that's me. He talked about it so much that David Ingalls uh, 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 heard about it and he wrote a song that's on his album, I Sure Love You. And if you haven't heard it, I hope you get to hear it because it's my testimony of being raised from the dead. Whenever the name of Jesus is spoken, angels stand alert on the balconies of heaven. They're ready to be dispatched on behalf of a believer who would dare to speak that name in faith. Demons start quaking and quivering in fear whenever a believer would dare use the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. And my little sister's crying out, Jesus, 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 oh Jesus, he's my baby brother. And my best friend up there in heaven, he says, you gotta go back, she's using that name. You got to go back. She's using that name. And that's why I'm here. I'm a man on assignment. I'm a man on a mission to make Jesus real to this generation. And I slipped back into my body. They rushed me to San Juan County Medical Hospital. They stabilized me. Early the next morning, my father entered into my room. He gave me this devastating report. He said, son, because of the extent of the injuries that were occurred in the accident, the doctors have just informed me you're never going to be able to speak again, let alone be able to sing. The turn signal indicator sliced my nose off. It crisscrossed my face. It severed my vocal cords, rendering me unable to speak. I have over 100 stitches in my face. I thank God for plastic surgery. If you don't like the way I look, I do. I thank God. I thank God that doctors could repair me and put me back as I appear. My jaw was broken in three places. My neck was broken in three places, C1, C2, C3. If you have a break in C2, usually it will result in your death. I, or if you survive it, you will be a paraplegic. I have the exact same break that Christopher Reeve, Superman, had. And you know he finally succumbed as a result. All my, you have to have a sense of humor when you've been through what I've been through. All my teeth were knocked out. So I say my teeth are like the stars. They come out at night. Some of you can identify and you didn't have an accident. My larynx is crushed. I needed a miracle. Every medical personnel that's ever examined this x-ray attest to the fact that I should not be standing here before you. I should be a paraplegic. I needed a miracle. And my father said, you're never going to be able to speak again, let alone be able to sing. Now, when you get that kind of devastating report, you forget whatever name tag is over the outside of the door of the church of which you're gathered into to worship God. The church that I attended at that time taught that God was the great I used to be. He's the great I will be. But I needed him as the great I am. When you're in this mess right now, you need him as the great I am. Some of you are sitting out there right now and you need him. Over the internet, you need him. You need to know him as the great I am. It'd take another whole hour to preach, but I got into the word of God. I read all the way through the Bible. I saw and saturated myself in the miracles of Jesus. Jesus opened the blind eyes and stopped the deaf ears. You couldn't die around Jesus. Dr. Larry, Jesus is the only preacher I know that never preached a funeral. Never preached a funeral. He broke them up. Everywhere he came, there were dead people. He raised them to newness of life. Hello? And I began to see a different picture than I had been taught in cemetery. I, I, I mean seminary. I began to see a real, live, vibrant Jesus. 
a Jesus that represented his father going about doing good works, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Suddenly one day in the hospital, nine months take place. Now it didn't take nine months to get a miracle, but it took nine months for me to renew my mind, to get the word of God inside and get religious uh, uh, bondage and tradition loose from me. And I heard a song. And the song was by a precious young couple that just come on the scene and their brother accompanied them. And the song went like this. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something wonderful happened. And now I know he touched me and made me whole. And in my condition, in my mind, I couldn't verbally express it, but I said, oh, Jesus, what that song says you can do, you can touch me. You can heal me because <clears throat> you've, you've commissioned me to share this. And how am I going to be able to share it if I can't speak? And Jesus just walked into my hospital room. He just came walking in my hospital room right while Bill Gaither and Gloria and Danny were singing. He didn't say anything this time. He just walked over and put his hand on my throat just like this. He just smiled at me. I looked deep in those beautiful eyes, those eyes that are like rivers of love. And then he just smiled and he just walked out, th out of the room. Oh, excuse me, I forgot to tell you, he didn't come in through the door. He didn't leave by the door. He is the door. And right after Jesus walked in, the little nurse walked in and she had her tray of food for my breakfast. She'd been doing it for the past nine months and doing a good job of taking care of me and helping me to heal and mend. And this, this didn't seem like any other different uh, type of day, except it, it was because... Jesus had just preceded her. And when Jesus comes on the scene, everything changes. I want you to start for the rest of this year to expect suddenlies. 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 Things that you have been dreaming for. Things that you've been standing on the word of God for that seem dead. Get ready for them to resurrect. Get ready for startling things that will astound you to transpire. She walked in that day like she had done every day prior to that time and said, Good morning, Mr. Wood. How are you doing this morning? And I threw my hands up and said, Praise God, I've been healed. She dropped the tray. She went running outside. She got the doctor. The doctors came running in. They started examining me. I was just sitting there praising God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. You touched me. You touched me. You healed me, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. They walked in. They started sticking things down my throat. They said, open your mouth, say ah. They said, you can't talk. You can't speak. It's impossible. I got a second opinion. Dr. Jesus said, I could. And I've been going everywhere telling everybody, Jesus saves. Jesus heals. I checked out of that hospital. I'll never forget when that elevator door opened up and the person inside said, going up. I said, I've already been. Let me tell you about it. And I started telling everybody. 1976, it's another whole story, but let me just give you this real quickly and I'll close and we're going to pray. But in 1976, I was baptized in the precious Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. According to Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14, when you are born again, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. This happened in John 20, 21, when Jesus said to his disciples, receive ye the Holy Spirit. And that's when it happened, what we would call a born again experience. Now, don't go telling the Baptist person they don't have the Holy Ghost. Because they know Romans 8, 9, if they know the word, 
Without the Spirit of God, you're none of His. Amen? But that's not the fullness of the Spirit. That's not the empowerment of the Spirit. Jesus told His disciples, go wait there in the upper room and you shall be endued with power from on high. It came as flames of fire and it rested upon them. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. And they went forth from that upper room and turned their world upside down. I remember being invited to the first annual Southern Baptist Charismatic Conference in Dallas, Texas with the then Dr. Howard Knatzer of the Beverly Hills Baptist Church. And I was Baptist, but I liked this man as I saw him on TV. He looked like to me like Moses must have appeared. Beautiful, white, stunning hair. And I was drawn to go to this convention. I remember that he heard my testimony, about my testimony. He asked me to give my testimony. I got up in front of 5,000 people, briefly said what I said tonight, and 5,000 people leaped to their feet and started singing, He touched me, He touched me, He touched me, and oh, the joy that floods my soul. I went back to my hotel room, got down on my knees, lifted my hands up towards heaven, and said, Oh, God, I want all the power that's available from earth to heaven except speaking in tongues. You think, come on, you think I'm kidding. Except speaking in tongues because I am a Southern Baptist. And God, here's what we believe. Have you ever tried to tell God Almighty, creator of the universe, your theological position? I heard his voice, Dr. Larry. I was 27 years old and I heard the voice of God audibly other than when I was in heaven. And here's what he said. What's a Southern Baptist? I'm not kidding. And that's what he would say to you. What's a Methodist? What's a Baptist? What's a Presbyterian? Because God doesn't look at it through that scope. Amen. And I just surrendered. And that's all he wants us to do. That's all he wants all of us to do. I just surrendered. We used to sing that old familiar hymn when I was in the Baptist church growing up. I surrender all. I think we ought to bring that song back. All to Jesus, I surrender. All to Him, I freely give. You know? And I just surrendered. And out of the midst of my belly began to flow rivers of living water. And now I have had the blessed honor and privilege of going all over the world and sharing this amazing testimony. Never, never did I dream as an 18-year-old boy, how could I make an impact? How could I tell what I saw? But now I'm speaking over the internet. I've been blessed to go all over the world and to share this amazing story. And I want to invite you. I want to be sure that you're ready and prepared to go to heaven. And I want to pray for you because the same Jesus that healed me, he's here to heal you. I just recently read this story, and I'm going to close with it. It's, I just thought it was so powerful, and I just want to use it in closing before I pray for you. A tourist was in Switzerland, and he was looking at a beautiful mansion on a lovely lake shore. And the house was well kept. The gardens were uh, tidy along the pathways. And it was just beautiful surrounding, not a single weed in sight. And saw the, so the tourist saw the caretaker and he walked up to him and he said, how long have you been taking care of this beautiful garden? To which the caretaker replied, well, I've been here in charge for 20 years. And the tourist said, and during that time, how often has the owner of the property been to the residence to see it? And the gardener smiled and said, he's, he's only come four times. 
And the tourists responded, the Vishta responded four times. And you've kept this garden so beautiful and in superb condition. You take care of this just like you expected him to come tomorrow. To which the gardener replied, oh no, I look for him to come today. He's coming. He's coming real soon. And he's going to take us to live with him forever in a beautiful place called heaven. And I want to be, I want you to be prepared to go there. Would you stand with me? Let's just lift our hands and praise him. All the glory is here. Yes, God's glory is here. I can see, feel his mighty presence in the very atmosphere. So whatever you may need, just reach out and receive and say it's mine. I take it now. Just lift your hands and let's love you. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Because he first loved me. Let's just sing one more time. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. How I love Jesus because he first loved me. I want to ask every head bowed just for a moment. The Spirit of the Lord is here. And those of you that are watching by internet, perhaps there's someone or even someone here in the auditorium tonight. And if your heart were to stop beating in the next 30 minutes and you were to have to stand before God, you don't have the peace and assurance that he'll say to you, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You don't know with confidence that you'll enter in and live for all eternity in this place called heaven. And that's the first invitation I want to offer tonight. I want to be sure. I want to be sure that everyone is prepared, even those that are watching. Maybe someone has turned in on the Internet. Maybe someone's invited you to watch via the Internet. And you just don't have the peace of God that passeth all understanding. And I want to pray a prayer. If you're here tonight, and you don't have the confidence that heaven is your eternal home, I want you to just lift your hand up quickly and say, pray for me. Anyone at all here in the auditorium? Looks like everyone here is believers, but perchance if there's someone watching on the internet, would you all pray with me this prayer so that we can be confidently assured that everyone is going to be able to go to heaven because of the precious fled blood of Jesus. Just pray this along with me, if you will. Say, oh God, without Jesus, I'd be lost, separated from you for all eternity. 
I don't want to die and go to hell. I want to live with you in a place called heaven. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says, If we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I want you to cleanse me of my sin. Wash it away with your precious red blood. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. From this day forth, I'm going to serve Jesus. I'm turning my back on the world, the flesh, and the devil. And I'm going to tell everybody and help prepare them to go to heaven. Thank you, Jesus. I believe I receive. Amen. Now let's just rejoice. Let's just rejoice over his forgiving of our sins, washing the slate clean, and making us white as snow. Now lift your hands up and say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. I receive you tonight as a free gift from my Heavenly Father. You said ask. And you shall receive. I know you're a good God. You're not going to give me anything bad. You're only going to give me what's good and beneficial. So I open my mouth. I will begin to make utterance unto you. To pray spirit to spirit. I believe I receive the precious gift of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. I will not be denied. Tonight is my night. In Jesus' name, amen.